All right, Great American, we're going to do this quick. We just got a message from Principal Blanchard that we have to be out of the building by 2 o'clock today. So I'm going to go a quick cursory overview of Operation Torch. Before we get to that, uh, my office hours are going to be, I was going to say after spring break, but it may happen earlier, 11 to 1 p.m. starting on March the 30th. I'll be online checking at that time. If you need anything, email. I, have a, I will, of course, continue to check email um, throughout um, the day and can increase hours if needed. Also, during that time, if you could email me, I will send you the Google Classroom code and I can upload our tests and quizzes. And as always, listen for the audio podcast. Now, what I'm going to do in a minute is show some pictures of Guadalcanal. For those other people out there in YouTube world, if you've got an interest in this subject, this is great. But let me be clear, this is for my high school students. We are trying to teach all of World War II called Great American Conflicts in one semester. Yes, I know there are many little subtleties to this and many things I'm leaving out, but our big issue is time. So if you're going to be a hater or a troll, nobody cares. In this time of crisis, do something positive, all right? Be a good human. If not, go troll somebody else, because I can honestly tell you nobody here cares. And if you really want to track down my high school email and be that big of a creep, good on you, mate. But once again, nobody really cares, so try and do something positive instead of being a jerk. So there's my message to YouTube world, and there it is. So, what I was telling you guys before we left was the living conditions of, you know, Guadalcanal. Here are guys hanging their machine gun ammunition, Marines with those cloth belts I told you, trying to dry them out to make sure they wouldn't jam up their machine guns. And I don't know if you can see, but here's a guy with an M1 carbine, and he's got a tripod 30 caliber on this shoulder. His buddy here, who's chest deep in the swamp, is carrying two boxes of ammunition, and the guy in the back has the tripod and um, uh, the old um, World War I style with the water cooler um, on the back. This is the conditions the guys are living in in the South Pacific. This is something that they should have had time to practice for, but they clearly did not because they never got that jungle training like they were supposed to. So I'm going to quickly jump us back to Operation Torch. Now, Operation Torch is important um, since we've been given the time and we've got to get out of here today. I've got to speed it up um, a little bit. And yesterday I was telling you the story of George Patton. And if we ever see each other again in class, I'll tell you more of his idiosyncrasies. George does compete in the steeplechase. However, his horse rolls over an obstacle, breaking his clavicle. He was assuredly going to medal, probably gold medal, but with the injury, that doesn't happen. But amazingly, he takes his belt off, forms a splint, and finishes the steeplechase, like a three-mile race through the woods and over obstacles. I can tell you exactly how painful that is. If you look at my left shoulder and then my right shoulder, you can see my right shoulder is about an inch lower. It hurts really bad. Patton shakes it off. He is then stationed in Texas where he kind of bullies and thwarts and cajoles his way into going into Mexico to chase Pancho Villa where he will get into a Wild West style gunfight with some of Pancho Villa's henchmen and become attached to General Blackjack, John Pershing's staff, and he will fight in World War I. Lots of things going on in between there that we honestly don't have time to talk about right now. But Patton stays in France after the war. He studies tank tactics. He is a Francophile. He loves um, France. And the other weird thing that's worth mentioning is Patton believed, I mean, he's got some weird, bizarre idiosyncrasies, that his spirit was resurrected and inhabited a body when there was true evil to be dealt with. And he would be resurrected, and it was his job to combat and defeat true evil. It's what he did, and he really honestly believed it. He is going to be the guy 
that's going to lead Operation Torch. And at its beginning, even Patton gave it a 50-50 chance of success. We are going to leave from three different ports, you know, in Europe and in the United States, and we are going to meet at a third, and we are going to invade with very little intelligence French territories in Morocco and Algeria. It's also going to be the first attempt at Anglo-American, British and American cooperation. And Eisenhower is selected to lead this thing. And he's going to lead it from the British base on Gibraltar, where a lot of things are going to go wrong. When planning this back in London, Americans didn't like the idea of landing in North Africa. They're like, what the heck for? It's North Africa. It's tertiary. There's nothing there. And Churchill, <laughs> bullet, <laughs> this big baseball bat cigar, said, no, we want to attack through the soft underbelly of Europe. We're going to need that staging area. And then the idea of stretching um, Hitler's resources. He's fighting in Russia. Now we're going to make him fight on a second front way down in North Africa. But Americans are, no, sledgehammer, by God, we're Americans. Let's go right at him. And Churchill is very correct when he says, wait a minute, guys, you don't know what's going on. These Germans are top-of-the-line soldiers. They've kicked the crap out of most of Europe at this point. So you can't go in there on battle test. You've got to bloody your troops. You've got to see which commanders can and cannot handle combat. Who can move with the ebb and the flow? You've got to get your soldiers Tested. You need a scrimmage match before you go up against a varsity team like the um, Wehrmacht. So you got to figure out who can do the job. And this is going to be big when we talk about a battle called um, Kazarine Pass. So to make sure this works, Eisenhower puts together like an all-star squad. Jimmy Doolittle, who's back from the Pacific, is going to be involved. Vice Admiral, now Admiral Bertram Ramsey, who helped the Dunkirk evacuation, is going to get involved. Patton is involved. Mark Clark, he's going to get the best of the best guys there are to lead this doggone invasion. And the Armada is going to set sail, not knowing what the resistance was going to be. Like Doolittle's Raiders, where are we going to land? Well, we're going to work on that while we are in the air. And so, with having to face the possibility of 250,000 enemy troops, you know, French, um, you know, German resistance, maybe Spain is going to um, jump in, we're not sure. So we try to sweeten the pot. We try to get um, proclaimed free French leader Charles de Gaulle to help out. He's like, oh, I've escaped from Dunkirk. I am in charge of France. And he claimed that he was the leader, but no one can stand him. The military commander was a guy named Admiral Francois Darlin. Can we work with him? And then the military governor, the Vichy collaborationist, collaborationist government, was a guy named Henry Garand. Problem is, everybody hates de Gaulle, and Garand hates the British, and we don't know how um, Darlin is going to react. And our plan was to try and get the governor, Henry Garand, to help out. So he secreted away. He's kind of a French national hero. He was captured, but he um, breaks out. And we want to bring him to Gibraltar in secret, in a submarine. But when things go wrong, um, the British wanted the French fleet to break away from Germany and come inside with them. The French soldiers in the Navy were in a tough spot. If they broke away from Germany, there were threats of German reprisals on their families back home in, in France. So the French Navy doesn't. And when hostilities open up, the British sink some French ships. Doesn't matter their justification, Henry Garand is pissed. So he gets on a submarine known as the Seraph. He put on an American captain, American XO, navigators, everyone else is British, and we kind of cover it up, and we're going to get him to Gibraltar on this British-slash-American submarine. He comes aboard, and he almost drowns. It's a giant debacle. And he gets ashore, um, or on the boat. He's going to Gibraltar on the submarine, and 
whether it was some British guy, a radio operator, the cook, you know, go save the queen, it's time for tea. Garon's like, what is this? This is an American ship. What do you, you know, bloody it ain't, Mike. You know what the fish and chips you talking about? This ain't that. It's fault, Mary Poppins and all that. And he finds out that we lie to him. So he's distrustful. And he's meeting with Eisenhower in November on the island of Gibraltar, where they're in this damp, you know, uh, manky, you know, room with like one light bulb hanging from like a copper wire, like something you'd see in the movies, and they negotiate, negotiate, and Garand is like, no, 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 I will lead the army. And Eisenhower's like, what army? I will lead the Allied armies. This is French soil. I must lead them. And we're like, no, there's a misunderstanding. You want to tell your soldiers to stand down. No, this is an invasion of France. I must lead it. And we're like, dude, you surrendered. Your country got run over. These are American and British troops. They are not going to take orders. No, no, this is the way it must be. And Eisenhower's like, no, ah, please don't issue me a sidearm because if I ever see that guy again, I may shoot him. So Garand will not sign this paper, um, giving us the authority um, to you know, liberate these French um, territories and have his... Um, soldiers listen to us. Now he's a politician, Garand is. He not, understands that he can only, you know, he's going to see who's winning. If we're winning, he'll jump in. If the Germans are, no, no, I resisted the Americans. And so Eisenhower's like, ah! So he sends his trusted aide, Mark Clark, ashore to see if, he, if Francis Darlin will work for us. Well, Mark Clark is like this big, giant, six foot five guy. And his commando raid goes terribly. There's a running gun battle with him, you know, getting back to a raft and rowing out to a submarine, and some of his men get killed. So we, the Germans can't help but to know something's up. The invasion will start on November the 7th, and it was poorly executed. This was our first attempt, and things go wrong right away. And part of the problem goes back to our man Patton. Patton was like, look, all right, um, I need to hurry this up, hurry this up. And the Navy workers in Norfolk were like, sir, we're packing the ship. We know what to do. You know, think like your dad packing the trunk to go on, on vacation if dad's the one that does it. He's like, no, I want you to go now. And what Patton didn't realize is there's a certain way to pack things, right? Like gasoline goes on the bottom, then fresh water and then clothing, or ammunition, then clothing, and then medical supplies, the lighter things on top, you know, food, things that could get damaged or broken or spoiled if any chemicals um, get on them. Well, Patton says, hurry up. So, of course, you know, like the medical supplies, you know, blood and plasma are on the bottom, and then food, and then water, and then ammunition, and then gasoline, and going over the, you know, the North Atlantic, crossing the big waves, everything, bam! Bam, bam, crushes in the ships and the gasoline spills out and it soils and destroys some of the food and fresh water and medical supplies. And it's all Patton's fault. And he realizes this and says, oh man, maybe I screwed up. But as his men go in to attack, um, he shifts downward from Casablanca a little bit. And he sends his men in. And the tide is not right, guys start going ashore, and they're pinned down by French machine gun fire. And there's a big um, French battleship known as the Jean Bart. It's, it's in dry dock, it can't sail, but it's cannons work. It begins firing at the um, Armada. And Patton is there watching it when a marker shell is fired. It shoots and it you know, hits and it splatters like mustard yellow paint all over the ship and Pat. And Patton's age like, come on, General, we got to get you cleaned up. They've got a range on us now. He's like, bull oh, crap, get me a landing craft. I'm going down there. And Patton gets in the landing craft and he hits North Africa and he walks up and down the beach and machine gun bullets are whizzing by him. And one of the crazy things that he did was as a young officer, he stood and had men shoot at targets on the firing range so he could get accustomed to the sound and bullets in combat 
drove his commanding officers crazy so he wouldn't be afraid in battle. And Patton is one of those guys that somehow magically, mystically, he doesn't get hit. And he's like, come on, get up, soldier, get moving. You're going to get shot if you stay here. The tide is I'm coming in. And screaming and cussing and swearing, Patton is able to get his guys ashore. In the other areas, in Iran and Algiers, some of the things went right. Some of the things went wrong. We used the 82nd Airborne for the first time ever. Their parachute drops are missed all over the place. Um, some things go right, some things go wrong. More things went wrong than we thought was possible. So it's a miracle Operation Torch succeeds. But another American destroyer will sail up a small stream where there was this um, big ancient castle known as the Casbah, and they fire their guns into it, into it, and they break this chain across this little canal. And on November 10th, after three days, the French surrender. And they tell their German counterparts, we have fought against overwhelming odds. We did everything we could, but we're forced to surrender. Now, it's important to note that Spain never jumps in. The French heavily outnumber the Americans, but they said, all right, we have upheld French honor. We did everything you asked. Shucks, we lost. And so while it is you know, a debacle and more problems are going to happen, the Americans have landed. And it's going to take time to sort things out. The British are kind of like, oh, it's about time you gangs, you know, showed up, you know. And Americans are like, well, what the hell, cowboy? Maybe if you hadn't gotten kicked off the beach in France, we wouldn't be here, you know. Oh, you Americans think you're so good because you've got materials. Well, you know, I beat you in the Revolution and War of 1812, and we're, you know, dang, dude, you're like 0 for 4, and we're, you know, you know 3 and 0, so you might want to get on the, the bandwagon. There's tension between American and British troops. And one of the things the United States doesn't do well is when our men enter combat, we don't remove them from the front lines. British, uh, Canadians, free French are much smarter. After 10 days, two weeks, they'll bring their guys back, let them rest up, get a hot meal, relax, and put them back on the front line. So in the middle of this, Americans don't, take, don't like taking orders from British officers. British officers look down at the Americans. There's that famous rigid British, you know, there's there's also non fraternization between officers and men, but there's still kind of the social hierarchy gulf. You know, some of the officers don't like Americans. So when Americans tie in to relieve some British soldiers, you know, the British soldiers don't tell them, hey, there's landmines there, there's a machine gun pit there, um, this is their um, routine. They just kind of pull out and, and leave things. Some guys like urinate in their foxholes. And so we start doing the same thing when moving to another area and the British are coming back online. There's all kinds of small problems we can talk about forever, but we don't um, have time. All this is eventually going to get worked out. And we really look at the plan and say, my God, 50-50 chance this would have succeeded. How did it? Well, the, I, the reality is the Allies got very lucky. And Hitler is now starting to freak out. Stalingrad is not going well. Over in Egypt, Brit, um, Bernard Law Montgomery, British general, is going to win. We'll talk about it tomorrow, the Battle of El Alamein. And now the Allies have landed in Western Africa. And so now things are going to be compressed. And Hitler begins to have some seeds of doubt. Can we really fight on all of these fronts? We're in Russia, we've got to occupy France, we're fighting in Eastern Africa, we're fighting in Western Africa now, we're fighting the Battle of the Atlantic. What can we really do? And what this will do is, after these initial stumblings, Americans and the British, the cousins, are going to work out their problems and become a, a foundational, very fruitful, dominant military alliance. So, we're going to get to North Africa tomorrow. Um, you guys stay safe, keep your social distancing, and I'll talk to you soon.